Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to see you looking at Gary Habermas's PhD and minimal a fact approach to the resurrection. The PhD is a defense of the resurrection. We've just been looking at Hume scholarship with a few uh, thoughts from C.S. Lewis as well. I'm going to listen to Gary Habermas talk about the minimal a fact approach and then we'll move into some thoughts on the on his PhD and then move into uh, reflections on what we've read and heard. Eyewitness data. You know, after rhyme things for, I, I teach a course for the uh, PhD students, and for PhD students, required books go by colors. So you take out your orange book, uh, so you do in grad school. And then we talk about alliteration, because it's easier for grad students to remember things. We don't do this with undergrads, because they don't remember whether you do it or not. But with grad students, I say the two E's, okay? Early and eyewitness. Just like the George Washington question. We want people who are there. And we want people who are in the right place. You say, well, eyewitnesses could be wrong. Yes, they are. But what are you going to do? Cite nine, eye, nine eyewitnesses because eyewitnesses could be mistaken? No, we still use eyewitnesses. And we want them to be people who are in the right time, right place, asking the right questions, and so on. And it's real helpful if they're enemies. It's real helpful if they change their view. It's real uh, helpful if there's checks and balances, and so on. That's how we do history. All right. On my little timeline here, that's going to be creation down there. This is the cross. Scholars usually say 30 AD, but you'd be surprised how seldom they answer that question. Uh, probably the second most popular date is 33. I'm just going to say ground zero, give or take. It's about 30 AD. Down there is 2011. Now, before I do minimal facts, let me give you a typical way that somebody, I'm going to have to be real sketchy, but when somebody says the New Testament's at least a historically trustworthy book, let me talk about how they're going to do that. If you say, well, how do I know the resurrection happened? On this timeline, I'm going to say, well, one very common on the reliability argument response is going to say, well, the book of Mark is written, and I'm going to use skeptical dates, okay, so you can see it's not that huge an issue. Uh, the book of Mark is written about 70 AD. We're only plus 40. You have to study ancient history to know how good plus 40 is. It's just, it, it's great, great time period. Okay, using critics' dates, Matthew, about 10 years later, at plus 80. Luke, about 5 years later, at about plus 85. Acts, plus 85, plus 90, something like that. Everybody, conservatives and liberals, puts John at about 95 AD. So my point is that if the, the worst it gets is we're about plus 65 to John. Now, critics often deal with sort of a double standard when they deal with the New Testament. And they're going to say, yeah, 95 AD, Matthew, uh, 50, Luke, 55. Isn't that getting a little bit late? But when they ask questions like that, they're either, they either, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but either they haven't studied a lot of ancient history or they're not familiar with sources or they're just being overly critical of the New Testament or whatever. Because if I said, all right, forget Jesus for right now. Let's say ground zero is the death of Alexander the Great. What are our best sources for Alexander the Great? What are the best sources? Well, there were several people who wrote during Alexander the Great's life, but we don't have any of those sources. We don't have any of them. They'd be very valuable. We don't have any of them. The sources we have for Alexander are, and I'm gonna, I'd have to keep walking way out past this window because the best sources for Alexander date 300 to 450 years after his death, about 330 B.C. The two best sources are Arian and Plutarch, but they're also the latest sources. They're about plus 425 to 450 A.D. That's a long time. You go, okay, fine, I get your point. Maybe Alexander's not the best example. Uh... We have better examples than that. Yes, we do. But I'm just using Alexander because he's such a prominent source. Well, how about somebody who's better data and closer to Jesus' time? Okay. How about Tiberius Caesar? He is the, the Caesar who's on the throne when Jesus dies, dies just a few years after Jesus dies. We have four major sources for Tiberius and a total of about ten sources for Tiberius. We have more than 10 sources for Jesus. You go, yeah, but that's those prejudiced New Testament sources. Okay, more about that in a second. Uh, use the way critics use. We, 
still have more than 10 sources of Jesus. You know, we have a dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament for Jesus. A dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament that are within 100 to 150 years after Jesus, which was fair in the ancient world. And now when I say 100 to 150, you realize that John's a lot closer than this. But back to Tiberius. We have four sources for Tiberius. One is contemporary. Whoa. We don't have anything like that for Jesus. But as I'm going to argue tonight, we do. We have sources, as I'm going to spend the rest of my time explaining, that go all the way back to 30 AD for Jesus. Okay, so next best source. By the way, the earliest one for Tiberius, the, the historian who, who gives the contemporary data, he's the least useful. The least useful of the four sources. The best source for Tiberius is Tacitus. And Tacitus, if that's Tiberius down there, ground zero, Tacitus, we'd probably be two-thirds of the way up the pews here. Because Tacitus writes, sorry, that's the last guy. Tacitus is going to, that's John, Tacitus is going to be out here. Tacitus writes about 120 A.D. He's plus 80 after Tiberius. Suetonius, plus 85. And Dio Cassius, two-thirds of the way up or further. Dio Cassius is plus 180 from Tiberius. So, well, okay, I see where you're going, but I have the ultimate objection for you. Gospels record miracles of Jesus. That disqualifies them. Really. Well, Greco-Roman, we'd say in English, files, it's not pronounced that way in Greek, but Greco-Roman files, it's a genre of biography, Greco-Roman biography, the, the most uh, reputable writing in the ancient world. We have, say, the father of history, so-called Herodotus, all the way through such names as Thucydides and all the way up to Livy and uh, Julius Caesar himself, and I already gave you some names, uh, plenty, but we also have Tacitus, Suetonius, Dio Cassius, and so on. These, these guys write bios, and almost every Greco-Roman source includes miracles, prophecies, portents. Livy, probably second only to, Tiber uh, to Tacitus for his reputation as a Roman historian, uh, Livy records the founding of Rome by Romulus and Remus, the boys who were raised by a wolf, hundreds of years before his earliest source. He was obviously false. But we do doctoral dissertations on this material, and it's fair to use this, this material instruction. You go, well, I don't trust any of it if there's miracles. Or if there's miracles of Greco-Roman sources, is not a rival to Christian miracles. So you've got to ask the question of which miracles are, are evidenced. And I'll just say this to be provocative, and then I'm going to have to move on from my minimal fact deal. Um, almost every skeptic, skeptical scholar, not the fly-by-night guys that don't work in the field, that just take shots at Christianity, but skeptical scholars, I don't care how liberal they are, how far the left, virtually everybody today believes that Jesus was a miracle worker. Now, they're going to differ on how supernatural these things were and everything else. That's another question. But it's almost unanimous today, among even Jesus Seminar people, they'll call Jesus a miracle worker and an exorcist. In fact, two of the best books that are out on this subject are each almost 500 pages. Sorry, I've nearly fallen asleep there. So, that's Gary Habermas explaining more of his minimal fact approach. Basically, what he's going to say is you're looking at the dates of the spectrum of the text from the, the Gospels from 60 to 70, 80, maybe 90 AD, depending whether you're conservative or in the middle. Um, but what he's going to say is the Paul's epistles, specifically 1 Corinthians 15, goes right back to 33, 32 AD and gives you historical information about Jesus and you can use that then to give a case for Jesus' resurrection. Um, what we've just looked at in Gary Habermas's PhD is that um, is that uniformity of nature does not preclude the possibility of miracles. 
If it did, you would need to know all the miracle claims that have been made and to have debunked them, and that's not been done. When a criteria, when you have a criteria for investigating miracles, as you did, it actually proved to him that miracles do take place, but he still didn't believe. Page 102, the human testimony uh, favour of these occurrences is impressive, especially in view of the fact that it concerns claims of supernatural events. Um, that's Habermas. Swinburne, Swinburne writes, um, Habermas is quoting Swinburne. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the, f than, than the facts which endeavours to establish. It's always rejecting the greater miracle. Sorry about that. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous. I think that's uh, David Hume. Um, I would disagree. I think that it's basically just you're looking at history and you're just using historical methods and if the historical methods are pointed to the fact that an event took place that seems to be supernatural then so be it. You don't have to have greater evidence to outweigh the uniformity of experience. You just have to have evidence. Simple as that. Uh, Habermas says, the fact is that we only know a small part of nature and cannot be sure that what we do know will continue to be the same in the future. In other words, this so-called uniformity of nature, that the way things are, we don't see any dead people rise, is only our small understanding of the natural, natural world. Uh, he quotes uh, C.S. Lewis, I think, the whole idea of probability, as Hume understood it, depends on the principle of uniformity of nature. We observe many regularities in nature, but of course all the observations that men have made or will make whole um, cover only a minute fraction of the events that actually go on. Our observation would therefore be nonetheless non useless sorry. The whole idea of probability as Hume understood it, depends on the principle of uniformity of nature. We observe many regularities in nature, but of course all the observations that men have made or will make only covers a minute fraction of the events that actually go on. Also, um, Haribamas notes that we can't prove the uh, uniformity of nature. And that I think that Lou, uh, that you actually agreed with that in his uh, writings. He um, Habermas notes that David Strauss was heavily influenced by David Hume. Uh, Schleiermacher was of the opinion that miracles suspend the laws of nature. Bruno Barr strong. Um, strongly says that we could not have miracles um, coming to you to nature. Ernest Rayner said that Jesus did not know the laws of nature. Adolf Harnack said they were ancient ways of thinking. Paul Tillich said miracles can't interfere with the laws of nature. So So Habermas uh, deals with um, lots of scholars in the all uh, in the past and in the present on this issue of uniformity of nature. 
which is significant if we're saying Jesus rose from the dead uh, we have to challenge this idea that because nature doesn't show any miracles they don't happen we, it can be challenged philosophically